Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Jessica Gonzalez and I am the School Mental Health Coordinator with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network, also known as MHTTC. Today we launch our School Telemental Health Series with today's session on best practices for student engagement through telemental health. This session is one of three in the series and I just want to quickly thank our wonderful speakers today and the amazing MHTTC team who helped plan the series. A big thanks to all of you also for joining us today, and we truly hope that you find today's presentation helpful. Next slide, please. So we want to start off with a few housekeeping items. We have made every attempt to make today's presentation secure. If we need to end the presentation unexpectedly, we will follow up using your registration information. A reminder that all attendees are muted and cannot share video. If you have a question for the presenters, please use the Q&A pod and ask the questions throughout the presentation. We will have a portion to answer questions at the end of the presentation today, but as we continue to go on with the presentation and our speakers um, provide their information, you can go ahead and use the Q&A pod to submit questions. If you have a comment or a link for all attendees, you would be able to use the chat box. The session recording and the slide deck for today will be posted on our website within a few days. You will also receive an email following the presentation on how to access the certificate of attendance. And if you don't already, please follow us on social media and stay in touch with us. Next slide. So for those of you who are new to the MHTTC network, the network accelerates the adoption and implementation of mental health related evidence based practices across the nation. We develop and disseminate resources, provide free local and regional training and technical assistance for the mental health workforce. Next slide. Here is our lovely map displaying the centers that make up the MHTTC network. We have 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. After this presentation, please visit our website and find your center so that you can stay up to date on trainings and resources that are offered in your region. Next slide. The MHTTC network has a three-year supplement to expand training and TA on the implementation of school-based mental health services. School mental health specific activities that are put on by the MHTTCs through our school mental health initiative encompass multiple service modes, various topic areas and populations. Next slide. This webinar series is just one example of the training that we offer the school mental health workforce, all free of cost. Next slide. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in the presentation are the views of our speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. Next slide. As part of receiving SAMHSA funding, we are required to submit data related to the quality of this event. At the end of today's training, we ask that you please take a moment to complete a brief survey about today's session. Next slide. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's get started. Next slide. So we have two presenters starting us off today who will discuss equity in school telemental health. We have Angela Castellanos, a licensed clinical social worker with 25 plus years of expertise in the mental health care industry and school settings. She specializes in administering school mental health programs, mentoring industry professionals at the local, state, and federal levels. We also have Dr. Kazike Prince, who provides executive consultation and coaching services focused on cultural competency for individuals, teams, and organizations. Next slide. Angela and Kazike, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll pass it off to you. 
Well, thank you so much, Jessica. How are you doing, Angela? Good morning. Good morning. Good. Uh, well, our, the, I think the fundamental question we're asking is, all, are, are all the kids all right? And Angela and I are going to just cover some highlights here, and then we're going to leave, uh, hopefully, for good discussion later on. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, please. Some of the things we want to highlight when we think about some of the challenges we're dealing with here in the pandemic, and please, Angela, get in here where you can. But the first thing I want to start off with is acknowledging the institutional racism and many of the biases, systemic biases that we're dealing with as a country are still alive and well. For some reason, we thought maybe if there was a pandemic, we would all get together and these things would, be, would go away. But in actuality, there are, those disparities are manifest as we have learned over the last several weeks. And so what we're also acknowledging is that oftentimes our, our kids are at more risk than maybe they were before around mental health and physical health uh, challenges that they're experiencing, particularly because of the collective trauma many of us are experiencing through this pandemic. Uh, some of the old uh, traditions that come, kind of are rising their ugly faces is this divide between the clinical work they were responsible for, but also the administrative work and how do we balance between those two. Uh, there's also the issue of gatekeepers, who actually receive the services that are supposed to be um, uh, provided for the young people that we're working with. Oftentimes, we have people who say, well, it's there, isn't it? When actually, it's our responsibility to make sure that young people are having access to those resources and we're not acting as gatekeepers. There's this issue of online learning. You know, we expect that our, our young folks are somehow supposed to know this information and, and educators and teachers and, and mental health workers know this stuff as well, when in actuality there's a learning curve because we have different engagement styles, we have different communication styles and learning styles, and we haven't quite figured out how to do this right. There's the digital divide that many of us are aware of around Wi-Fi and computers, whether you're in rural communities or urban spaces, but we still haven't quite figured that out, and so we're kind of faced with this issue. It's kind of, in our, in our kind of rising up again. Uh, there's just a general access because some people, whether you have uh, your own private insurance through providers, or if there's public access to uh, telemental health resources. Again, even if it is available, how do you actually, have, uh, actually access it in really powerful ways? And then there's the issue of how do you actually infuse our social emotional learning activities with the telemental health work that we're doing because we need that support to make sure what we're doing uh, through our technology is actually supported in other spaces as well. And Angela, I wanted to make sure I gave you a space yeah, to- thank yeah. you. And I think some of the additional pieces that we're looking at is kind of piggybacking on what you're saying is that collective trauma. Um, and one of the things that we're noticing in the, um, in the environment is that, you know, kids that didn't have any mental health issues before, we're actually identifying them now. And also some of the kids that had mental health issues um, they're decompensating just because of the, um, just the capacity, the resources, the grief that they're experiencing. And so that's, you know, part of the challenge that we have right now is how do we provide all of the support to all of the students? And also the last piece too is making sure that the accessibility piece as well. We have a lot of um, families that are also dealing with their own like social economic um, issues in regards to like maybe losing a job, losing that healthcare facility, uh, healthcare access as well, and then really connecting to providers that can actually provide some of that support. And I think one of the other pieces too is disseminating that information to those families that don't that have that limited access as well. Those are some of the different challenges that we're seeing as well. Cool. If we go to the next slide, please. And some of the questions when you're thinking about from a diversity, equity, inclusion focus, and that's what the DEI is intended to mention is that it's asking a fundamental question. Do we have information on the, the families and young people that we're working on? We're making a lot of assumptions. So, and then is that information disaggregated across race and gender and other issues? Because sometimes we have information, but it hasn't been broken down to help us understand what's actually going on with our communities. Uh, and so it's asking a basic question. Do we really know what's going on? We did when we saw them every day, but now we haven't seen them oftentimes, sometimes for several days, if at all. And so really trying to figure out what's actually going on. Uh, how do we uh, make sure our decisions really impact uh, racial and economic equity? Because oftentimes we make decisions not knowing how that decision actually impacts this issue of e uh, racial and economic equity. And so asking every time I make a decision, how does that kind of, what are the ramifications of that decision? What other re uh, informal resources are available? 
Oftentimes people are using their faith communities, they're using family and friends uh, as a nice, uh, uh, for, I don't want to minimize it, but sometimes it's a band-aid for the resources that we might want to offer because oftentimes they may not feel like they have other options to them. But being aware of those resources is really important because those, those are the additional supports they're going to have in place. Uh, next is looking at how our parents and students influencers being used to help us do the work that we're wanting to do. Because sometimes because of the, uh, uh, the value and opinion of our family members and students, can we encourage other folks to access the resources we're having great difficulty having our young people actually access. Uh, then there's a the question of how are we accessing partnerships and oftentimes schools are feeling quite isolated in their ability to actually achieve their goals. And so how are they partnering with a city, state, uh, county resources? How are they working maybe with the faith community, excuse me, faith community, uh, faith-based organizations, business and nonprofits to get what they need done? And then how, and let's be real honest, are we attending to the burnout that many of us are experiencing through this pandemic? Oftentimes we're trying our best to serve other folks, but we really haven't served ourselves well. And so sometimes the priority needs to be, how are you doing? And some of our school districts need to be looking and asking a really basic question. Are you doing okay? Because if you're not doing okay, how can you serve your young people well? And Angela, again, I'm sorry, I want to make sure you uh, have opportunity. Thank you. And I think the other piece, additional focus is um, to really uh, have the community be aware of any legal implications, like any um, issues related to um, confidentiality, any resources to immigration issues, resources for those particular populations that are, um, that we know have um, some kind of a, either disparity, right? So either having contact with our homeless students, foster. So those are some of the different pieces that we want to make sure that we're, you know, being aware of as far as like any legal um, implications or information resources for that population. If you go to the next slide, and we'll be wrapping up here shortly, but I think one of the challenges we have in the time that we have is that we're going to be tapping into a lot of subjects around diversity, equity, inclusion, and we won't be able to cover them all. But this is an attempt really for us to touch on them so we can have some hopefully vibrant conversation later on. And so when we look at potential solutions, it's doing some of the research and serving of our families, because some families, what we found here in Austin, they're begging to tell people what's going on. They're wanting to say, you know what? Life is rough and it's hard and, and we want resources, but we can't access them. And they're looking for a space to actually give feedback. And so this time, unlike maybe other times, is a great time to ask these questions of our family, whether it be small groups or through surveys. Um, again, surveying our staff is really important to see what's going on with them. But also, it's a good way for us to identify what are those student leaders, who are those family influencers who can really have an impact on uh, people who are accessing the resources that we're wanting folks to, to, uh, to access. The other thing I think is important is how do we partner with, uh, for example, uh, food banks or other people who are other organizations or have regular contact with folks so we can stack the resources we have available. So if someone's coming in for uh, to, to re receive food from a food bank, uh, maybe that's an opportunity where they get information about telemental health and what might be available in the community. Because maybe before that, they it wasn't a priority, or it just wasn't on their mind, but now they find out through that resource or that opportunity. Um, again, we've talked about accessing partnerships and that's gonna be really critical because to be honest, when we think about returning to school in the fall, what are we going to do in the summer? How can we possibly work with our nonprofits, with the city and the county to make sure that we're doing the things around SEL to, to, to support our young people as they prepare for the fall semester, assuming they come back in the way they did before? Uh, and then lastly, uh, how do we uh, build some sense of uh, using accountability or restorative circles? A lot of people across the country have really used restorative circles uh, practices. Uh, and they've abandoned them during this process because of uh, the change in technology. When in actuality, that's a great place to start to get young people and others and families together uh, as a tool to approach, but also using accountability groups where professionals are actually talking with one another about what's going on with them, not just informally, but making it part of the work that we're doing to keep ourselves in our righteous minds. Anything else again, Angela? No, I think I'm going to cover at the next slide. Thank you. Sure, yeah. So um, one of the things that I, you know, just 
because of time, uh, one of the areas that I wanted to focus on specifically is that now we've had almost 10 weeks of um, being at stay at home orders and we're slowly transitioning back. A lot of the different states are, are transitioning back into um, releasing some of those uh, modifications, right? And one of the areas that I would really highly um, encourage a lot of the school districts is to set up a debrief right now at this point to really have a conversation about how to utilize some of the um, providers, right? Because we're gonna help be helping um, kids transition back into the summer. They're gonna have to have different activities, learning different opportunities. But I think the other piece too is like really um, including all of the different stakeholders that we know are uh, participating as part of this process, um, looking at having the kid voice, right? In, in regards to including them in this particular summer months and transitioning back. But I think overall, it's really important to make sure that you're including all of the different stakeholders, all of the different populations, specifically connecting to the culturally responsive, whatever practices that you decide to use is making sure that they're culturally responsive, that they're provided in the native language of the particular um, student and families. Um, if you don't have that capacity, um, look around your neighborhood and see what provider uh, provides that particular um, area and support and expertise. Like, you know, here in, in Orange County, and we have some um, different populations, the like Asian Pacific Islander groups that we can actually connect with, faith-based communities as well. And then making sure that you're providing some of that additional support for families so that they're able to understand um, some of the transition that's going to take place uh, during the summer months. Um, and that really concludes our, our you know, part of the presentation. And so Jessica, we'll have you lead into the next uh, presenters. Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Angela and Kazike. I see great comments in the chat box. Angela and Kazike will be available to answer as many questions as they can in the Q&A pod. And we will also use the second part of the session today to have our presenters answer some of those questions live. So please continue to submit your questions in the Q&A pod. Thank you. Now for the next part of our session, we have Jennifer Cox, who will discuss school telemental health for children K-12, to followed by Kay Connors, who will do a focus on specific considerations for young children. Jennifer Cox is the program director of the University of Maryland School Mental Health Program and has been leading telemental health efforts in the SMHP for over five years. She quickly and effectively helped to convert the clinical program to telemental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Kay Connors is the director of the Maryland Center of Excellence for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and has been instrumental in addressing telemental health considerations for young children. Next slide. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'll pass it on to you now. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the previous presenters and Jessica for having us. Um, so today, um, yes, I would, first of all, again, my name is Jennifer Cox. I'm from the University of Maryland School of Mental Health Program. And we oversee about 22 schools in Baltimore City and I'm also part of the National Center for School Mental Health. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, this is a little bit of information about our National Center for School Mental Health. In the right corner there, you will see that the center has an amazing website um, that has COVID-19 resources there. If you, um, after this um, presentation wanna go, you can find resources for families, for teachers, for providers. Everything is free there. There are tons of trainings. So, Please go check that out if you need any further guidance too after this presentation. Next slide. So today we just wanted to give you an overview um, of setting up and conducting telemental health sessions. Um, tried to squeeze a lot of information into a couple of slides in a few minutes here. So don't worry if I go through it fairly quickly, the slides will be available afterwards and all of the links are also there that will take you to a lot more resources um, to help you get started. Um, so whenever you're starting telemental health sessions with clients and families, you want to start off by really making sure that you introduce telemental health. For all of us, we know that there's a learning school with telemental health, learning curve um, with telemental health, and you know we're just getting used to it. So we need to make sure that we are introducing it to families and clients also appropriately. We can do that by describing the benefits and the challenges. Um, we know that technology is always a challenge, um, but also there's a lot of benefits to telemental health. 
Um, there's a lot of access, um, students are satisfied with it. And right now with COVID-19, with many states and counties under state home orders, it may be all you have available in order to outreach to families. So that is a huge benefit right now. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, after a good introduction, it's really important to talk about in, um, informed consent and confidentiality with clients and families. I know this was on a couple of the questions that were submitted and um, confidentiality can be very challenging in, in this time that we are now um, kind of beaming into families' homes. Usually they're coming to our offices and we take a lot of care to protect confidentiality and make sure that our clients are safe in our space, but we don't have that much control at home. So we do need to direct our families to do things like maybe create a do not disturb sign on a door or if um, families are, um, I think there was a question about like teenagers, if they don't want their parents to hear certain things, you know, if a, somebody walks into the room, you could create a secret signal, you know, something so that you could, the child could, could communicate to you that they need to stop and pause the session because somebody off camera has walked in and they really just don't want to say, hey, stop talking because mom walked into the room. Um, so here are a few tips there um, about it um, on the slide, but most importantly about consent and um, confidentiality is to consider safety. So a lot of our, our children are moving homes during this time due to childcare concerns. So maybe one day they're with mom, one day they're with auntie, the next day they're with grandma. You really wanna make sure that you have a release of information for all of those places if something comes up during your sessions, you wanna make sure that you have permission to talk to the person that is right there and closest physically to that child. Um, also, you can, along the secret signal, if you're concerned about confidentiality, um, talk to uh, teenagers about wearing headphones. You know, that way you could, um, so much is, you know, not heard over the computer. And also, we also suggest using the chat function for teenagers. You can see them and you guys could be chatting back and forth on a tele-session, but not really um, sharing it, um, the audio of your session with everybody in the home. Go to the next slide. Um, staging matters whenever you're doing telehealth. Um, when we're in person, we don't really need to consider and stay in a frame all of the time, but it is important to consider what is in your background. Do you have good lighting? Do you have good sound? Um, with our really anxious kiddos, um, we want to make sure that we're making what they see visually comfortable. If you have a child that has some anxiety, um, they may be really checking out your background and being concerned about what is all around you. So having um, a lot of space behind you, making sure it's not dark and um, it's easy on the eyes will help your sessions go more smoothly. You can go to the next slide. Here are just uh, some examples of do's and don'ts. You can see kind of all the way on the left, it just looks very pleasant. She looks very welcoming. Um, the other um, staging there, you can see, you might get distracted by seeing what's in the background or by checking out shadows or saying, you know, hey, what is she looking at? Um, on tele, as much as possible, try to keep an eye on your camera versus looking down and typing and we know we have a lot of things going on, but you want to make it feel really comfortable for families and clients and trying to have that implied eye contact at least can be helpful. Next slide. Tele is more difficult, um, you know, as far as energy goes. I think everybody knows that. I know myself, I'm on Zoom calls a lot of times, just back to back, and it's just exhausting, even though I've really sat in the same chair all day long. Um, but we need to know that we have to bring 110% of ourselves. Um, you can do things to build rapport with families and clients. I mean, you can do virtual high fives. You can do fist bumps. You can take your... Um, computer around and give a tour of the office or share artwork and have your clients do the same thing. Um, so those are just, you know, a few things to keep in mind as you're building rapport and um, self-monitoring the whole time we're doing sessions. Move to the next slide. Try to avoid this guy. Um, nobody really wants to be looked at like that by the therapist, right? Um, but you can imagine sometimes you want to look closer and you're getting closer to the screen. You're trying to see what's going on. But in reality, that doesn't help you. <laughs> if you get closer, um, you can zoom on your screen rather than, um, again, having this guy look back at you. Next slide. Um, a couple of tips for before, during, and after this session. Um, please make sure you turn off all your smart devices. 
So things like Alexa or the dots, you know, those things are made to listen for your voice. And so just to protect confidentiality, I always unplug those. Um, close all of your browsers on your computer. They are sucking up your bandwidth. So um, the less things that you have open, the more bandwidth you're gonna have to transmit your session. Always have your phone ready for backup. Um, if you can directly plug into the internet again for bandwidth. And um, if you can, you know, try to use the same space each time. Um, again, this can bring a sense of comfort to clients and families because they're gonna know what's in your background. When we have sessions, we don't typically take them to a different space when we're in person every single time because it would be distracting even in person because a child would want to see what's in that space, check out a new space. But if you can use the same space, if you're working from home, if it's a home office, a bedroom or something, so it's the same background each time, that will help people um, to feel more comfortable. If you're using any websites or tools, have them available. And if you want caregivers there, you want to make sure that you're talking to them ahead of time. Next slide. Um, and also, you know, as we were talking about this kind of Zoom fatigue, you may want to consider breaking up sessions. So if you typically would have a 40 minute session, maybe doing two minute, uh, two 20 minute sessions instead may be helpful. During the session, we've talked about a couple of these things. Um, using time checks is very important. I'm getting one now. I know I have to be fast. Um, any interactive tools that you can use. By the end of the day, we're hoping to have a whole bunch of games that you can um, use for telesessions up on the National Center for School Mental Health. So please go there, check out those games. There's charades, tic-tac-toe, bingo, all kinds of things that you can use in sessions. Next slide. Uh, we talked about student safety already, but again, just making sure you have those releases of information is very important and knowing that you um, Find out what your local resources are and what is, an, what is available in case of an emergency. Next slide. All right, um, ending the session, just always try to end on a positive note. Um, plan for your next session. What will you need in the next session? Do you want um, clients to bring paper and pen, you know, favorite stuff to add, a nice icebreaker? Um, make sure you are just preparing for the next time so they know what to expect. Next slide. This is a lot of information here, but some tier one strategies. If you are working in a school, just some ways to connect with the school, um, you know, using their Facebook and Instagram pages, Class Dojo, um, all of those things can help to keep um, our students connected to services during this time to let them know that um, we are still here, we are still taking referrals is very important. If you can set yourself up a Google phone number, that will help protect your privacy also um, and reduce the concern of sharing phone numbers. You can use that, it keeps a log on it, and um, it, it's a great way to connect with folks. And um, if you wanna skip to the next, one, next slide, there goes my timer, sorry. Um, just, there are um, a couple of resources. Again, these will be on the slides. Uh, if you want to keep scrolling through, I'll just very quickly just say check this one out. It's a great way to connect with a, a whole classroom or a group of students. Next slide. Um, this is for teacher wellness. Lots of good links there. Next slide. And another very good resource you can use individually in sessions or use in small groups or classroom presentations, which we're doing in Baltimore. So um, please check out all those resources. And I think that's my last slide. Yep. Okay. I'm going to pass it on to you. I don't think I'm too far over. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jen. I You're recommend welcome. that podcast that uh, or that uh, video that Jen um, referenced. It really helped me. Um, I'm I'm of a certain decade that I'm not the most comfortable with technology, so uh, I definitely recommend that. So, uh, and then you know I focus in the area where people are like, can you really do uh, telehealth with babies? So that's really what we're going to think about together today. Next slide. So actually we've learned a lot from our military families about how to use video chats and video experiences to support connections. Um, so they, I think they really led the way in uh, showing us that babies can engage um, in video chats, but it has to be at their developmental level. So it has to be social and interactive. So in the same way Jen was talking about fist bumps and other signs and signals, there's good old fashioned peekaboo, 
um, other just hand games, uh, ways to connect with little kids. And of course, it's going to be pretty time uh, time limited. You know, uh, their attention span is going to be about you know one minute uh, per per their year. So, uh, use props and toys. Um, you know, bring back those old fashioned paper dolls and hand puppets and also just other engaging um, toys that you might ha uh, keep by your side. Um, you can, uh, one of the things that we think about a lot in infant mental health is this idea of reflection. Um, so when we're with a family, whether it's virtually or in person, uh, we wanna hold a space um, to support the relationship. And so one of the ways we do that is we use reflection either talking, talking for the baby, or reflecting back um, uh, thoughts and feelings that a, a parent or a child are expressing. Uh, you can still do that in, in video, and you can even use um, hand signals, ways to kind of emphasize that you see a loving touch or um, a supportive um, interaction. Uh, so try to be with uh, using, using your hands and your facial expressions. Um, Explain any technical difficulties. Uh, little kids, particularly like preschool kids, tend to think if something um, is going wrong, it's their fault. That's how I always feel about technology, that somehow I've done something wrong. But uh, as we, as our previous speakers uh, uh, spoke about, there's digital divides and there's uh, inequities and just basic problems um, with bandwidth. Uh, so just kind of building that in. Um, knowing that that can be a concern. So the, um, the a wonderful tip sheet is at zero to three, uh, and it can walk you through this uh, a little bit more. Next slide, please. So why would we be providing these early childhood mental health services uh, during this time? And it really is an amazing opportunity to support parents. So as opposed to working with school age or teenagers where they really are able to use individual therapy approaches through tele, uh, our work is really uh, parent, child, and family related. So it's a wonderful opportunity to help parents um, and uh, talk with their children about the thing that's happening. And so the thing that's happening right now is the COVID outbreak. This is a quote from a lovely British video um, that if you have time to check it out, if you're on Facebook, that starts with a little, the little boy saying, when they say fighting the coronavirus, I thought they were literally fighting the coronavirus, like punching the sky. So Take it, this kind of opportunity helps parents take a step back and really see things from their children's uh, point of view and helps people, helps them to slow down and really listen to their kids and, and uh, carefully answer their questions about this enormous change that we're all going through together. Next slide, please. There are wonderful eBooks and we ha our team has had success in sharing through the um, share your screen function on our tele platforms um, to actually do some tele bibliotherapy um, through, through technology. Um, the goal isn't just to read a whole book, but it's really to use as a prompt um, to be able to stop and ask some questions and create um, conversation and thoughtful discussions between parents and their young kids and to help kids ultimately feel like they have a better understanding of what's happening and why these changes have occurred. Next slide, please. Um, this is something that I've learned from my trauma work uh, through my mentor, Alicia Lieberman, and it's really thinking about kind of the essential um, things that drive uh, mental health concerns in, in young kids. And these are really fears that we can actually all connect to at any age of life. So a fear of pain, a fear of loss and separation, a fear of losing love or approval. Uh, this is very important, particularly to preschool age kids, a fear of getting sick or, or your body being hurt. So some of the stories that um, I've been privileged to learn during this uh, qu quick rapid change uh, to technology, uh, to using telehealth is one of my first sessions um, 
a little girl with a little girl who is four and her mom the mom was saying that her daughter really thought that she was not going to school because she had done something bad. And that's a really typical age appropriate um, cognitive frame for um, a four year old. But the telehealth session, and we use some of those books that I was talking about, really helped me to support the mom um, in, in her trying to um, support the child to understand that 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 the changes were not not the, the little girl's fault. And so it helped to have another person um, backing up the mom. The other thing that I've heard a lot um, is fears about getting sick. So um, kids understand the idea of germs and they're worried that they will get sick. Um, and parents have been very focused on that. But what I've learned through these uh, parent-child moments is that kids are very worried about their parents getting sick. And so young kids um, are worried about who will take care of them if their parents were to get sick. So it's a really good opportunity to flesh out some of these fears. And as Alicia Lieberman says, speak the unspeakable. And I think the wonderful thing about parent-child work is it's bi-directional. Uh, the two-generational two approach, you're both helping the parent put into words their own fears. And at the same time, they're then able to support their child and feel like a more effective parent. So it's a um, it's a win-win. Next slide, please. Um, my favorite quote is uh, from from Mr. Raj, Fred Rogers, who says, "If it's mentionable, it's manageable." And this telehealth um, approach is largely focused on parents because little ones will not be able to have an hour-long session. Um, but a, a good portion of the session will be with parents, and that's really how we work in the um, in the clinic space as well. Um, it's a very parent-driven approach when you're working um, with very young kids. So we're able to help them um, not only talk about what's happening, um, both maybe prior to the COVID uh, outbreak, but also in the current um, stressful situation, but also helping kids feel like they can manage what's happening. And that's really how we build resilience in children is helping them feel capable. So talking about why it's so important to wash their hands and to wear their masks and to, to keep apart and talk to their neighbor from across the yard, but not go into their house. Um, the other thing that is um, really helpful to little kids is um, to help them think about uh, the helpers. So all the people that are um, helping people stay well and helping keep uh, food on our table. So um, that's that's kind of maps on to what's often in the early childhood or um, a pre-K classroom is units on the helpers. So that's something that you can focus on as well and bring in toys that, that represent that. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also, again, wonderful ebooks, and we have um, a whole um, list of these that you can easily link to and easily use in your telehealth session. And it's on the um, National um, uh, Center for School Mental Health website that, that Jen mentioned under the COVID section. Uh, so just a shout out to my um, colleagues at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Katrina and Sam fighting the virus is a wonderful resource and it's in um, many languages, including Spanish. Next slide, please. So just in summary, what's working? Um, our team, uh, this is kind of a compilation of, uh, I asked our team and some of the people that I'm training um, what, what they think is working in this early childhood telehealth space. Uh, so definitely it's helping with increased access because if you can imagine if you have three kids and you're trying to get to any kind of healthcare appointment, uh, that can be quite a challenge. So being able, being invited into people's homes is a privilege. And uh, I think there's, it has felt like a warm and welcoming, even sometimes dizzying space when, you know, kids are moving the iPads around and um, things can, can feel a little bit um, confusing. But it's also a wonderful in vivo opportunity to really see what, what uh, family life is like. And 
parents often come to the to sessions and sometimes they'll even video some of the symptomat the problematic behaviors they're concerned about that are the target of intervention they're actually happy for you to see they say you know when he comes to see you he he behaves perfectly but that's not how it is at home so parents are often um, happy to let you see what what things are what what it's really all about um, it has certainly reduced some isolation for parents and they've been grateful even if they didn't have the time to talk with us they've been grateful for the check-in uh, some parents have even said it's been a lifeline you know to help them uh, really talk through some of the stressors um, that they're, the stressful experiences that they're under and their concerns about are they doing a good job as a parent um, it's also a way any trauma-informed approach is uh, kind of within it embedded within it is uh, thinking about the past uh, trying to manage within the present and thinking about the, the future. So uh, just as each of us are thinking about what was life like before COVID, how are we coping now, and how are we getting prepared for recovery? And preparedness is really one of the keys to um, resilience in, um, in disasters. Uh, the other, uh, just the other two quick points is I'm amazed by the creative ways that people learn to play, the books that people are creating. Um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And so this has been, I think, a wonderful opportunity to witness that. Um, and also, uh, one of the important works in, in, I think, of all child and adolescent work is the collateral, um, working with collateral providers. And through the tele uh, system, it's been a lot easier to bring in um, child welfare workers, um, teach early uh, child care folks, other folks. So it's, you know, you can send the link to multiple folks with, uh, with the parents' permission and bring them into the treatment plan. Next slide, please. The part that's really difficult, and I think that that um, our pre our uh, initial speakers spoke of this as well, is uh, what's unseeable, and and that's really one of the challenges. Is um, when our youngest kids are at the highest risk of um, child maltreatment, but also at the highest risk of injuries and serious um, physical out um, being injured. Uh, through child abuse and neglect. And so uh, without our teachers who are frontline reporters, um, we might not be seeing um, some of the concerns. And there are concerns about privacy, about what, pe and what people can say, what parents can say if they have concerns about domestic violence or other family violence issues. And so uh, I think we're still working hard to learn um, and, and keep our eyes and ears open for any um, signs of abuse or family violence. Next slide. Uh, so I just wanted to, in addition to the wonderful resources at the uh, Center for School Mental Health and, the, um, and SAMHSA and the um, MHTTC folks, uh, just to point you to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and Zero to Three's um, resources as well. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Kay and Jennifer. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. We now begin the Q&A portion of our session. I will let Sarah McMinn school-based mental health project manager with the MHTTC network, lead us through this portion. Welcome, Sarah. Great, thank you, Jessica, and thank you to all of our wonderful presenters. Um, I hope that so far this information has been beneficial to all um, that are with us today. Um, I'm just gonna go through a few, um, as many questions as we can, um, and go through the ones that are um, more common um, and that we uh, got from both folks that submitted them earlier and then also in the chat box throughout the session. So just to get us started um, to our presenters, um, how, how do you suggest making students more comfortable um, or how um, using video um, or how to engage with students that are anxious or avoidant of using um, the video feature? Um, do you have any tips on, on working with students to make them more comfortable with that? 
think I mentioned a few things in the presentation about like, you know, using the same room, um, giving tours, like I will literally pick up my computer and walk around the room um, to give a tour so that people can be comfortable with that. Um, and I think it really depends on age range too. Um, for high schoolers, again, it's about, you know, and, and older children, it's about protecting their confidentiality. So when they're in school or in your office, that's such a safe place. So if you can talk to, to parents to help, you know, children create that space or talk to the child about, you know, where do they most feel comfortable in their home? Or is it really just sitting out right outside their home or using those things like headphones or the chat function that can help some of the older students. Um, I also know like, you know, we sometimes have difficulty, we're having difficulty right now with billing where for certain services you have to be on video. Um, I haven't read anything that says like, we actually have to see that child. So I even know of some, ch some teenagers that are on video, on audio, but the lights are out in the room. So we really can't even see them. And you know, sometimes they're sitting in their bed in their pajamas because you know our teenagers are sleeping until two in the afternoon right now. Um, and I'm comfortable with that, you know, that's okay, that's fine. We're getting the session done. And then maybe later on as folks get more comfortable, you know, it's kind of about exposure, right? Um, maybe we can have a dim light on or a window open or a light on and kind of work around to it. If, if I may add, one of the things I've been uh, becoming keenly aware of is, <clears throat> and this is a cultural perspective, is that people, some people have more of a, um, you know, introvertedness versus extrovertedness. And some of us get overstimulated being on these computers. And so if they've been on a, a computer screen for whatever reason, and now they want to have a conversation over, uh, it's, it's hard because you feel like someone's like literally intensely looking at your face and it feels overwhelming. And so having that mindset, I think will help us understand how, I mean, we do it with the kids, we see how they start looking and not looking at us. Why are we any different with young adults? So being mindful of that and being more and more comfortable with the idea that we may not have video available to us, but we, we have other things available to us in those sessions. And so I think that's just, again, from a cultural perspective, something to be mindful of. Sure, and nothing really says you have to have your, your um, self on the video either. I mean, using something like a video, um, I have this great one of this puffer fish deep breathing, right? So like the client's not even having to look at me, like they're looking at this YouTube video. Um, so I think that sometimes that can be helpful. Uh, great, thank you. Um, and a follow up to that, because uh, you kind of uh, spoke to this a little bit, but any tips on working with uh, students or youth that are having um, technology or screen fatigue? A lot of us are on the on on camera and on on the screens more than we're used to. Um, any any tips uh, to, to combat that um, in, in the work that you're doing? I, I can tell you, having a conversation about being fatigued. In itself can be very powerful uh, because it's like we're not talking but we're just it's kind of happening but no one's actually attending to it and when you ask questions about how's it be how's it like to be on on, on screen like this they're like actually now that you ask me <laughs> and so that in itself can be a conversation but other tips are just like we said earlier turn it off uh, we have so many things being thrown at us the audio the visual let's just attune to the parts that people feel comfortable sharing understanding that that's maybe all they have to offer um, and that's okay, and including ourselves. <laughs> so I think those are and those are some ways of thinking about it. I think I'll just add on to um, one of the things that I encourage um, even our staff or just to kind of take a break and then also like limit. I know that there might be some restrictions um, in regards to uh, having to have an hour um, session, those kinds of things. But if you have the uh, opportunity, you can actually break it up. Um, even for the older students as well, just kind of break up the sessions and then also maybe start off with like a, um, a mindful integration type of activity versus like just kind of going straight into the conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I second that with Angela that, you know, breaking up your sessions is ideal. Um, it's hard to sit for an hour in front of a computer, but a couple of 20 minute sessions here or there, um, you know, and look into your billing practices, but even if it's during the day, you need to put so much time together. If you did like a nine to nine ten, and then later did like a one to one twenty, there's your 30 minutes um, that you would need. And that's 30 minutes in one day. M typically you can bill for that. Um, and 
I also feel like people feel like they need to like really like change up the rules for telemental health. Like, you know, you have to be sitting like this, you know, um, in front of your screen. But, you know, I, I work with children of all ages and I, I very rarely have had a five or six year old sit right in front of me for an entire session. Like they're up and they're moving. And for me to have an expectation that they're going to sit in a screen and sit in the view, it's just that's that we can't expect that, you know, so if they're walking around and talking and doing something else like you get what you can get sometimes and you work towards getting it a little better if you really need a focus. Um, in, a, in another presentation I've suggested too, like breaking up your sessions into like talk time activity time play time like having some sort of stru structure so that child knows like I just want you to talk to me for five minutes and then our activity time is something that I've planned that I'm structuring, but then we're gonna have playtime when you do a great job. And you can really modify that for all different ages um, so that you're breaking up even your individual sessions. So it's just not so monotonous so talking. I think you can even move, build in movement, you know, yes. movement games as a way to interact and engage. And... Great, thank you all. Um, and a question about um, the topic of group teletherapy. Um, do, you, do any of you have experiences or thoughts on the pros, cons, and logistics of um, doing group therapy um, through telehealth? I think one great idea that I heard a school district doing, um, I mean, the, there's going to be challenges, a couple of things, confidentiality, all of those different pieces, but one or, um, district was actually, they do drop-in groups. Um, and so they have them scheduled throughout the week and then they have different providers uh, being part of that drop-in group and then they have a specific topic. But one of the nicest things that I, I learned from them is that they actually have, before they register into the chat, they have to uh, write in their, their name, their location, or even like using an ID number so that, that can, you can actually keep that confidential. So that way, in case that there's something that does come up during the session, you're able to you know, make sure that you're you know, contacting um, somebody in case that there's a crisis, a risk assessment. Um, and then the other piece too, is like if you're doing a drop-in group, maybe having a, um, a couple of um, facilitators so that in case that there is somebody that needs to have some follow up individually, you can actually do a breakout room with that particular person so that that other facilitator can continue um, providing that the additional group. So those are some additional um, some tips. Definitely, there's going to be challenges because of confidentiality. You might have some kids, you might have two uh, participants one week and you might have 10 the next week. So it just kind of varies on that. We're making some headway with offering parent groups. We have a a group called mom power so focusing on moms that um, have mental health and substance use uh, disorders um, being able to provide that uh, via tele and um, also some more promotional activities one is called parent cafe and it has some breakout uh, room virtual rooms in the way angela was talking about too so we're just learning we're in like week four <laughs> so more to come yeah and i want to I'm sorry, I wanted to add to that piece too. Is that the other piece with the parenting component as well? If you're having, um, there's a great feature that you can utilize an interpreter, the interpreter uh, function in Zoom, so that way you can still connect with um, other families that you know, making sure that you're providing the information in, uh, in their language. So it's a really cool feature that's offered as well. Yeah, and I was going to say just to be very careful um, about group structure and group rules. Um, and being very clear because it's tricky because not only are you inviting yourselves in, into people's homes, you're then now inviting other children into other children's homes essentially. And so especially when we're talking about um, kids that are like lower SES and you know, they, they don't maybe want to share what's in their home, you need to make that clear individually with everybody that other group members are going to be able to see what's behind you, what are you comfortable with, do you use one of those fake, fake screens if they can. Um, and I would always try to have a co-facilitator in a group. This is a great opportunity to have groups even like across schools. I've encouraged our clinicians to get together because we don't have to be in the same building. It's great. So if you can have multiple clinicians um, in a group. You can have one leading. Um, you could even have one behavior. And, you know, ideally you have somebody monitoring the chat because 
kids can go crazy in the chat and they can get mean in the chat. And so we need to make sure that we're keeping an eye on that and shutting down any kind of cattiness or mean girls or whatever's going on in that um, space. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more brief question. Um, and this came up in the chat a little earlier, um, but uh, talking about, um, I know Kazike and Angela spoke a little bit about this, but if you could expand on um, supporting um, staff uh, and educators um, and, and burnout. Um, many are, all are working from home and many have families at home as well. Um, and any strategies or tips um, that you that you can share to to support um, uh, decreasing um, feelings of burnout? I think one of the uh, creative ways is to start um, the conversation with administrators because you want to you want to have that buy in as far as like mindfulness and, and really um, validating and supporting um, their staff in, in sharing those kinds of resources. I think that's one aspect that you can actually, you know, start with administrators and then share any kind of um, research information. Um, there's one particular school district that actually is doing a uh, Mindful Mondays um, where for administrators where information is just kind of just a very short blurb and then you send it out and then you also send attachments to resources for staff members and teachers just to kind of validate that everybody's going through that same process, right? We're all going through this um, challenging time together. Um, I know we keep hearing this same um, concept of like we're all you know, in this together. But I think it really um, resonates and, and starts off with the conversation because once we come back to the, rea uh, the process of coming back to school, we're gonna have to start with the adults first, right? So that we can, you know, fill them up and then um, we can actually have um, kind of embracing or, or, or having those arms around our kiddos. So it's really important to start with that, with the staff and, and having that transition as well. And maybe possibly doing like a summer kind of retreat for for um, educators in regards to trauma and trauma response schools. So these are some ideas. I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, I don't know if Kazika had any additional pieces to add to that. Well, I just want to stress the importance of having buy-in from your leadership. If they're not supporting the kind of efforts you're talking about, the good ideas that you put out there, if they're not encouraging uh, people to do the kind of things you're, you're mentioning, it, they'll, they'll get constant pushback about priorities, what's important, what's not important. And you want to get out of that debate and get their support to do, do these kinds of things. Because again, if you're not in a space to do the work that's necessary because you're not taking space to do that for yourself, then of course you're going to be burned out. But first of all, it's just admitting that we're burned out. We're really great at focusing on others and putting our eye on other folks and telling them what's going right or wrong. And then we miss ourselves in the process. So sometimes just starting with, how am I doing? <laughs> am I stressed out? And if you are, then take care of yourself by any means necessary. Great, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for live questions and answers. Uh, hopefully uh, several of you got your questions answered through um, the Q&A box uh, with our presenters and, and our specialists that are on. Um, we will also be creating a frequently asked questions and FAQ guide that will be sent out uh, hopefully next week um, that have that will cover a few additional topics and I will turn it over to Jessica to do a final wrap up. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So it looks like we're close to the top of the hour. Again, we appreciate all of our speakers who shared their expertise today. Thank you so much. Today's presentation slides and recording will be sent to everyone in a follow-up email over the next few days. We will make these materials available on the MHTTC website as well. In addition to the recording and presentation slides, we will be posting a set of frequently asked questions based on the questions that were asked in the Q&A pod. Next slide, please. A reminder that this is just the first session of three in the MHTTC School Telemental Health Series. We have our next session on Friday, May 29th, at the same time as today, and we will focus on enhancing family school partnerships through telemental health. Information on how to register for the remaining sessions will be included in the follow-up email coming your way in the next few days. Next slide, please. Okay, it looks like we're not transitioning the slides, but I'll just wrap up really quickly with a quick reminder 
to please take a moment to complete a brief survey about today's training. You will be redirected to our survey upon closing the Zoom webinar. We'll also be sending the survey link in our follow-up email to everyone who attended today. Thank you again for joining us. Please take care of yourselves and have a lovely holiday weekend. Thank you so much. Bye.